Strávím Welcome. Сам бэтхан нь хүндэвлэгчтэй. Өнөөдөр орой манай де факто нь төрүүлгийн зочноор олон улсын засаглалын санааж шин санаачлалын төвийн захирал ноён Брэд Хаус оролцож байна. Брэд Хаус. Брэд Хаус нь олон улсын засаглалын шин санаачлалын төвийн гэш юм. Тэрээр Макгил их сургуулийн лектор. Макро эдийн засгийн хувьд Брэд мөнгөний бодлого, эдийн засгийн хямралыг шийдвэрлэх, худалдааг илүү чөлөөтө болгох зэрэг дээр анхаарлах хандлага нь ажилладаг байна. Брэд мөн та ухрын горуулалт менежментийн сангийн зөвлөхөөр ажилладаг. Тэрээр өмнө нь Wood Bayne Capital Strategic-р ажиллаж байснаас гадна нэгд үндэсний байгууллагын ерөнхий нарийн бичгийн дарагийн эдийн засгийн санхүүгийн бодлогын зөвлөх болон нэгд үндэсний байгууллагын хөгжлийн хөтөлбөрийн улс төрийн зөвлөх Колумбик сургуулийн Эрт институтын эдийн засгчаар ажиллаж байсан. 2000-2007 онд Брэд олон улсын мөнгөний сангийн эдийн засгчаар ажиллаж байснаас гадна Goldman Sachs Bank-нд ажиллаж байсан. Брэд Оксфордын их сургууль болон Капфе тауны их сургуулийг төгссөн. Тэр бээр одоогоор Маккил их сургууль багшилж байгаа. Мөн нэгд үндэсний байгууллагын тусгай мэрэгжлтнүүдийн бүлгийн гишүүн Банф Форумын гишүүн United World College-ийн Лейстер Пёрсны нэрэмжил сангийн дараагаар ажиллаж байна. Брэд 2010 онд Канадаас дэлхийн залуу манлалагчаар сонгогдсон байна. Good evening. Good evening. Very strange name. What is that about? International Governance Innovation. Well, I work with a think tank that was set up in 2003 to ensure that Canada was contributing substantially to improvements in the way the global economy is managed yes. and the way global political institutions are yes. managed. There was a sense that our institutions like the World Bank, the United Nations, the mm -hmm. IMF, which were created after World War II, mm -hmm. need to be reinvented mm -hmm. to take into account the rise of the BRICS, uh -huh. the Gulf states, and other emerging markets like Mongolia, mm -hmm. where many of these countries are not well represented. Mm -hmm. There's a need to represent them better within their mm -hmm. decision-making institutions, mm -hmm. and also change the way that they operate to reflect more diverse interests mm -hmm. that are represented by some of these countries. Well, wow, how successfully are you doing that now? Well, you know, global change is difficult. You have to have uh, a lot of patience. Yes. You have to put forward a lot of good ideas yes. and hope that parts of them get taken up. Yes. But not everything will be done in one go. Mm -hmm. You know, because in the IMF for instance, you're bringing 188 countries together. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. In the UN 192. Mm -hmm. That requires a lot of patience and mm -hmm. processes. to create agreement and consensus amongst mm -hmm. countries with very different interests but a shared interest mm -hmm. in the world functioning well. You were working for IMF as economist right? Yes. Over the years. And there is a very famous sort of prescription standby program. Mm -hmm. How do you find the program now after seeing it you've been working you have been working with that. Mm -hmm. How do you find the role of this program? Well, you know, I think the critical thing to think about on the IMF is that when a country goes into a financial crisis, mm -hmm. the IMF provides financing when no one else will provide money to a country, when the country has become too risky for financial markets mm -hmm. to provide financing. What the IMF does is work with the government to try to make its budget add mm -hmm. up and make its balance of payments add up. And the financing it provides normally allows a country to keep importing essential goods like mm -hmm. medicine, mm -hmm. uh, materials for construction, for infrastructure, uh, and the critical things needed to keep production going. Mm -hmm. In the absence of IMF financing, yeah. a country would either have to go to financial markets and pay With very, very high uh -huh. yields, or it would be completely shut out and consumption and mm -hmm. the well-being of people would be substantially reduced. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, one of the concerns is that uh -huh. the IMF sets conditions to uh -huh. go along with its money. There's no other way. There's no other way because there's no other way to collateralize yes. the financing it provides. Yes. You know, when you're a bank here in Mongolia, yes. if you lend money to someone to build a house or yes. buy an apartment, yes. if they fail to make their payments, mm -hmm. you can take over the ownership of that building yes. or that apartment. The IMF can't take over a country. Uh -huh. And so those policy prescriptions 
are meant to increase the likelihood mm -hmm. that a country will be able to pay back that mm -hmm. financing. In Europe, the people were very much, in Greece, for example, very much unhappy with these actions, stared austerity measures, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But however, I think they have accepted and they got go through now much better than before. You know, they've made tremendous progress mm -hmm. and the scale of uh -huh. adjustment that is being put into place in the European peripheral countries mm -hmm. is unprecedented mm -hmm. in other emerging market crises of the mm -hmm. last few decades. Mm -hmm. The problem is, you know, when you've built up imbalances over mm -hmm. decades mm -hmm. and then you try to fix them in only a few years, <laughs> the pain is going to be Not substantial. Easy, yeah. There's no way around that. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Greece, the distortions were huge. Uh -huh. When people were retiring in their 50s uh -huh. on very large pensions, when state-owned enterprises were employing 10 times as many people to do a job as a comparator Enterprise. country, uh -huh. there's going to be a lot of pain mm -hmm. in making adjustments. But what we've seen is that in only a few years, these countries have done mm -hmm. a substantial amount of policy reform. 2009, we had the same situation here. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, for a year that program. The country borrowed, I think, $282 million to fix car yes. payments, and which, which saved us. Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking that time, oh, it's, it's also good. It's disciplining the people, government, not to spend it much. Our problem here is when the money was a lot coming with uh, mining revenue, we were not using properly. They were the politicians, you know, cash distribution, whatever, to be elected, re-elected. So as a result, today when uh, uh, commodity price go down, because this uh, consistent, non-consistent policy, foreign direct investment shrink, mm -hmm. and it's a country, you know, it's, we are less populated, most less, least populated country in the world, mm -hmm. we almost buy everything. So our import always higher than export, and then suddenly people cannot buy it anymore because there is no money. Then government says, "Oh, for that, let's." push a lot of money, printed money that they put into economics, and they even promise 8% mortgage rate when the market rate is about 14 or 16, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the difference. And then naturally, because the import and the FDI are not coming and the import is less, now the country has an uh, exchange problem. Exactly. And it keeps coming. Mm -hmm. What, say, uh, of course, every country from country to country different, but in that circumstance, as economists, as macroeconomists, what is the best to do? Well, what you saw with some of the spending in the last few years is mm -hmm. that it didn't go into increasing the productivity mm -hmm. of the Mongolian economy. All. A lot went into uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. And consumption doesn't, in most cases, provide you with a long-term source of growth. Mm -hmm. It boosts your growth rate for one year, mm -hmm. but then it doesn't provide a legacy. and so. What you need to think about, I think, in a case like Mongolia, is how to manage the inflows mm -hmm. that come from the development of the resource sector mm -hmm. in a way that truly provides for investment mm -hmm. that will increase productivity, that will make your other sectors mm -hmm. uh, more competitive so that you can start diversifying the economy, and takes away some of the decision making mm -hmm. from the discretion of a government in any one year, mm -hmm. and moves that decision making let's say to a council of wise people. Mm -hmm. That includes young people who will be most affected mm -hmm. by how that money is spent, mm -hmm. older people with experience, mm -hmm. people who've come back from abroad and seen how things work elsewhere, mm -hmm. and also people here who intimately know mm -hmm. the Mongolian economy. I think you can look at examples like Norway and Chile, mm -hmm. which have created funds mm -hmm. where they keep the money offshore mm -hmm. so that prevents an appreciation in the exchange mm -hmm. rate which makes your other exports less mm -hmm. competitive, mm -hmm. and they set a rule mm -hmm. on how much can be spent each year. Mm -hmm. It's usually no more than about 4%, mm -hmm. because most funds, if they're conservatively invested, particularly now with very low global interest mm -hmm. rates, are not going to earn more than 4%. Yep. And so you need to ensure that you're not only preserving the value of your capital, mm -hmm. but you're also spending it in line with your capacity how to, to use the money sure productively. How to make sure that they do in that way? Uh, unfortunately, in the reality, politicians have a short-term aim, interest, and very much under pressure to be re-elected. Every four years, we keep changing them. Mm -hmm. And these political parties, they have their own problems. They don't uh, report mm -hmm. their financing, for example, etc. So under these circumstances, this country, to keep these macroeconomics measurements on, uh, in, in place, not that easy. Well, 
What I would say is that Mongolia is not unique in this mm -hmm. regard. The problems that you face here are problems that we face in Canada mm. as a resource economy, mm. Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, many countries in Africa mm -hmm. face many of the same challenges. How do you provide for needs mm -hmm. in the present while at the same time ensuring you're investing for the future? Mm -hmm. I think we can learn lessons from places like mm -hmm. uh, Norway, mm -hmm. Chile. I think Canada is good to case. In, in some ways, but we spend far too much of our, our resource revenues on current consumption and infrastructure what spending as well. How many percent? Why you say well, large? One of the problems is that we have a federal system, yes. and so some of the resources go to the provinces, uh -huh. some to the federal government, uh -huh. and there's continual debate over how expenditure should be uh -huh. uh, devoted and spent. Mm -hmm. Alberta, which has a lot of oil, mm -hmm. has created a fund uh, that they're using to invest in human capital, mm -hmm. in healthcare, in better education, mm -hmm. but they're not investing enough mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. Some other provinces are not putting anything mm -hmm. into a long-term yeah, Because fund. they have nothing? Well, no, they have resources, okay. but they're not putting it into a long-term investment fund along mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. lines I'm advocating. So what I'm saying is that you know, Mongolia has challenges, but it should know that there are other countries that face mm -hmm. these same challenges at various levels of development. Mm -hmm. And I think what needs to happen is you know, the, the civil society, media, mm -hmm. youth organizations, community mm -hmm. organizations, mm -hmm. together with the political parties, need to push for the creation of a, of a council, let's say, that will learn from the best practices abroad and then create a fund <laughs> a you know, that is one arm's length from the politicians' immediate concerns, you know, that creates a decision rule for the spending of funds over time. An independent council. I think that's the way it needs to yep, go. That's exactly I think Mongolia is to go through. And speaking about foreign, um, you have been working with foreign debt restructuring of several government yes. uh, sovereigns. We have a big discussions in the country today that government public foreign debt is to be under 40% of GDP. Mm -hmm. But now the ruling party say no. For the developing countries, it doesn't work. Let's have a 70%. And a big debate is happening. What is better? Uh, I think that debate sounds like it's not well informed by recent history or the experience of other countries. We know that most low-income and lower-income emerging markets cannot sustain 70% on an ongoing basis. In fact, 40% as a threshold strikes me as entirely reasonable. Reasonable, correct. Even but at very small levels idea. of external debt, you can still hit payment stops, you can still hit financial crises, and you want to engineer a cushion, greater security rather than less so, particularly in an economy where there are so few sources of foreign exchange. Hold up one mine or one project and suddenly your foreign exchange uh, earnings are cut massively. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, you see depreciation in your exchange rate and the cost of those imports that you know are so critical to the economy go up incredibly high. Yes. So, you know, I think you want to skew toward mm -hmm. low public debt, low external debt mm -hmm. as well, in order to ensure the safety and security of the mm -hmm. economy. We saw at the turn of the millennium, you know, many low-income countries had their um, public debt mm -hmm. that was owed to the multilateral institutions, mm -hmm. the IMF, the World Bank, the Asian Development, mm -hmm. written off. And in many cases, those loans were given at 0.75% interest rates. It's incredibly low. And yet, even then, it you was not sustainable pay. to pay them. So I think there's a need for a great deal of prudence. And this is why a fund at arm's length from current decision making is so important. Because if you institute the right kind of decision rule on spending from it that smooths the amount you withdraw over mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. you can use it to cushion the mm -hmm. ups and downs that come inevitably Correct. in every mm -hmm. economy year by year. Welcome. Uh, how, what would be that uh, trigger mechanism that keeps doing this independently on political power? Mm. You know, I think something like a decision rule that says uh, you draw no more than 4% uh -huh. of the total assets down, mm -hmm. and then you adjust the total amount slightly by the performance of your investments mm -hmm. or new additions to the mm -hmm. fund, Mm -hmm. over the last three years. So if you've had a few very good years, then with a lag, the mm -hmm. amount you're able to spend will go mm -hmm. up. 
Mm -hmm. If you then suddenly hit a bad year, mm -hmm. your spending won't go down immediately. It will provide some cushion mm -hmm. against that downturn. You know, we have already that ceiling of 40%. Mm -hmm. And that's why they cannot, un un unless they will change the law, mm -hmm. as they are lobbying for, uh, they cannot change. But the, still the 40% of GDP equivalent foreign debt, we start to pay two years from now mm -hmm. already. Yes. Half billion dollar we have to pay. Mm -hmm. Five years. I mean, uh, 2017 we will start to pay. Or today is 14, uh, two and a half years. Um, how do we prepare for that? Do we make special aside money put aside or keep abroad? What is the best practice of being ready? Start paying, not ma much making impact on, sudden shocking impact on the economy. Mm -hmm. I think gradually putting aside funds. Uh -huh. If the investment has been made in a proper way, you should be seeing returns All from our, it. All our roads. All our roads. What well, do you think? Uh, I think it's unlikely that you're seeing massive returns from that in no. just a few years' time. Where do the roads go to, you have to ask? Yep. Are they going to uh, productive enterprises? Are they going to foreign exchange earners? If not, it only increases the need to start putting funds aside yes. now. Particularly because two years from now, or even a bit farther out, when you might wish to go into the international markets again, raise more money uh -huh. in order to finance and the debt service. And by that time we have to pay completely and say that we are good, right? Well, it's likely that interest rates are going to be slightly higher a few yeah, years sure, out. Certainly. The Chinggis bond that was issued yes. really happened at an exceptional time of yes. the lowest interest rates we've seen Possible. in global markets in 40 yeah. years. No one should treat that as normal. Uh -huh. That is a really rare occurrence. Okay and we should not make decisions based on interest rates at uh -huh. those levels. Well, that's the issue now. We have to pay this money shortly, soon, a couple mm -hmm. of years, and we have not yet started, and our politicians even don't think about that. Mm. They think only uh, about the uh, election in 2016, mm -hmm. and the 17, they got this, even the reason uh, they, b they get the loan, and the next government is to pay anyway. Right. So this is the approach they made, and. Uh, of course, uh, now people divide it into two camps. One says that we go with the, uh, more foreign debt. For what? Not clear. <laughs> the other part is no. We don't. So mm -hmm. that's the fight happening in, in Mongolia today. Well, I think any, any increase in spending, any mm -hmm. increase in foreign debt has to be embedded in a plan mm -hmm. that has broad support from stakeholders across society. Mm -hmm. So at the same time as I would recommend creating an arm's length commission mm -hmm. to manage mm -hmm. inflows of capital. In many ways, we haven't even experienced mm -hmm. a real mining boom here yet. There's yeah. the initial investment, yes. but of course, you know, the copper mine hasn't even begun, you yes. know, producing yes. yet. That's when the real they challenge have is going one, to come. One fifth part of it just exactly. started. The other seventy percent of that copper mine deposits are staying underground, exactly. one and a half kilometer deep, mm -hmm. and that's undermined is being sort of staying there forever now, mm -hmm. already a few months. Mm -hmm. And if they go, if we talk about another seven, they have invest al already invested seven billion, now they talk about another investing seven billion, which is a huge impact on the economy. Huge impact. Mm -hmm. And you know, what I think you need to do is you know, start a process of bringing uh -huh. in consultations across society to decide mm -hmm. how should these funds be spent in a way that will increase productivity, mm -hmm. and look at some of the research there. Now, None of the research is perfect, but we mm -hmm. have some very good data that shows mm -hmm. investing in human capital, mm -hmm. especially for, for very young people, mm -hmm. early childhood education, mm -hmm. four, five, six, seven-year-olds, mm -hmm. that produces much higher returns than investment in infrastructure or mm -hmm. investment in university education. Mm -hmm. you know, start building the mines now that will lead to much higher very growth later on. You know, the how, you how you can do it, ideally? Well, you know, keep it simple. I think, you know, we don't need to be fancy. Mm -hmm. You know, we see mixed results with introducing technology and computers. Uh -huh. The most critical thing is classrooms that are well equipped, uh -huh. you know, warm, safe, secure, and a low student to teacher ratio so mm -hmm. that teachers, mm -hmm. who are well trained as well, mm -hmm. can actually pay detailed attention to the students. What would be the country or place in your mind could be uh, a good sample for Mongolia? Well, the great thing is you have neighbors yes. nearby here yes. that took some of this development model to heart. Uh -huh. you know, if you look at South Korea, Taiwan, uh -huh. they invested a lot in uh -huh. early childhood education. 
and education more broadly, in human capital, in social, you know, social development, more so than uh, emphasizing infrastructure, physical development at early stages. We have more return on investment than the infrastructure ones. I believe say. so. If wow. you're going to do infrastructure, whatever you do, hmm. you need to have it embedded in a plan mm -hmm. that has broad support and is tied to some expectation of what yes. the returns will be. Mm. It's no good just to start spending mm. and hope that it will all work out. Mm -hmm. What is that Institute of Earth you were working? So the Earth Institute at uh -huh. Columbia University mm -hmm. uh, was uh, headed by Jeffrey Sachs, uh -huh. the renowned development economist. Yes. I worked closely with him while I also worked with the Secretary General of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. on mainly on helping countries mm -hmm. develop Millennium Development Goal consistent mm -hmm. macroeconomic policies. Mm -hmm. There was a hope following the 2005 mm -hmm. Glen Eagles uh, mm -hmm. G8 summit that the most uh, developed countries, the richest countries in the world, would, develop, would devote substantially more capital mm -hmm. uh, to development aid. Mm -hmm. There was concern at the same time, if a lot of development aid comes into an economy, mm -hmm. that can cause the same effects as a big boom in mm -hmm. natural resource exports. Mm -hmm. When that development aid comes in, they have to buy local currency, mm -hmm. it uh, appreciates the value of the currency, yes. it can then make your exports uh, less competitive yes. and hurt uh -huh. the attempts to diversify yes. an economy. What we were looking at is the ways in which you can ensure, mm -hmm. such as through education, productivity mm -hmm. is increased so that this worry about the appreciation of the currency mm -hmm. is offset by higher mm -hmm. growth. So you have been working all around the world in several universities. And let's say you are now a, a YGL, Young Global Leader mm -hmm. from Canada. Yes. What uh, attracted you to this whole Young Global Leadership in the World Economic Forum? Well, you know, I'm part of a visit here uh -huh. by uh, nearly 50 of us who are uh -huh. from around the world uh -huh. and one of the very attractive things mm -hmm. about this organization and becoming a member of it mm -hmm. is that you get to work with incredibly talented people mm -hmm. from every sector, mm -hmm. from entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. from corporations, from mm -hmm. industry, from the arts, from policy and mm -hmm. academia. That's a rare opportunity to work on complex problems mm -hmm. with people at the top of their game, mm -hmm. not only from a diverse range of countries, but mm -hmm. a diverse range of backgrounds too. And I think that produces better results. And it's so remarkable that this 50, each of them is a really a leader. They have proven a record of being a leader and that all together comes the world to make a better place. And that's very uh, impressive on uh, YGL. And uh, what do you think, what is the most important character for a leader? I think a leader has to be willing to serve and has to celebrate the notion of service and has to be devoted to the notion of helping others realize their potential. Services serving the others, right? Indeed. And uh, in Canada, I, I interviewed Mrs. Barados, who was the public uh, administration, uh, public, public administration, mm -hmm. head of public administration in Canada about the uh, human resources in the uh, mm -hmm. public offices. She told me a very exciting thing when the political party changed it, now the power has changed completely, right? Mm -hmm. Then no one in public office was changing. That's correct. Unlike many presidential systems like yeah. the United States. Here we wipe out everybody, almost the cleaner. Right, that, that doesn't happen in Canada. That doesn't give a opportunity to establish or to strengthening the institute as a public office. That's right. I think it's really important that the public service be outside of politics uh -huh. and that you maintain both the institutional memory yeah. and the relationships between people ag across government so they can truly make things happen and they can also give sound and impartial advice to politicians who come and go frankly now it often means that when a new government comes into power mm -hmm. after many years of being in opposition mm -hmm. there are some adjustments mm -hmm. there's sometimes some suspicion mm -hmm. by new ministers that the public servants are more interested in pursuing the policies mm -hmm. of the previous government. Mm -hmm. But generally there's a great deal of respect for the public service mm -hmm. and no politician uh, can question deeply uh, the motives of the public service because the public you know, broadly supports uh, this impartiality of the public service and believes that it is truly trying to act in the public good. 
in Canada on government payroll, who? The teachers, police, right? The fire department, mm -hmm. of course, and uh, government offices. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, so social services, social services. Uh, you know, healthcare as well, mm -hmm. uh, including doctors. Uh, yeah, we have a very robust social safety net. Yes, that's why all Americans go to you to have a treatment. <laughs> well, sometimes, but then sometimes also Canadians go to the United States because some of the most advanced technology, mm. being a smaller country, mm. where the price that we pay for services yes. is capped by the government, it means some of the most exotic treatments are not available in Canada. But everyone gets treatment. That's the phenomenal thing what you have, and also France has good system. It does. Yeah, in, you know, in, to me now, uh, being a, from Mongolia, I like your Canadian approach to your south, the largest in the world, neighbor. And uh, I think we have, should have the same one to China. And, but because the historic background, people have different opinions, mm -hmm. and I called the relations maybe a month ago, deficit of uh, trust. And I think we have to work on two sides yes. to overcome that deficit of trust. Mm -hmm. What is the best to well, do that? So, you know, Our former Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in the 1970s said that living beside the United States is like being a mouse sleeping with an elephant. <laughs> yeah. you, you may be protected by the elephant, you may be kept warm by it, but every time it moves, you feel it, yes. and it may at some time roll over you accidentally. Yes. <laughs> so you know you have to always be aware of the fact that you're a small country, that uh, the relationship is unequal, and then look for opportunities to you know, maximize the relationship. We signed a free trade agreement in 1988, which was the subject of huge debate in Canada. And for many years, it was not clear that it uh -huh. had been wholly beneficial to us. Are you happy now about that free trade agreement? I think even those who opposed the agreement at the time or had deep concerns about different parts of it, uh -huh. now say it has had a broadly positive impact on the country. Uh, it's opened up our markets to more goods. It's created opportunities for us in the United States. Some smaller manufacturers gone away, no? Because they're competitive the price, items come high quality. We've, we've, we've certainly here, had, right? we've had a hollowing out of our manufacturing sector in uh -huh. the center of the country, mm -hmm. but this is one of the challenges that comes of being a resource economy, and it's the kind of challenge that Mongolia faces too. As oil prices went up and we started pumping more oil out of Alberta mm -hmm. in the west mm -hmm. and Newfoundland in the east, that pushed up the value of our currency, uh -huh. and it made our manufacturing goods less competitive. And there's debate over whether that's wholly because of the currency, but I mm -hmm. think it must in part be one of the reasons we've seen a big reduction in manufacturing jobs in the center of the country. That's a big challenge for us because you know, we want to ensure the development of those resources mm -hmm. while at the same time ensuring we also have a high value added economy mm -hmm. that we continue producing things like Blackberries, mm -hmm. uh, high computer tech, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, cars and, yes. and other things essential to the uh, well being of the country too. Welcome. Hopefully Mongolia will learn a lot from Canada, not only in terms of how to get with the largest uh, elephant to live together as a mouse. <laughs> I hope so. All I can say is that we're very empathetic to the challenges uh -huh. that you face. And uh, one thing that's been a pleasure to learn about is the third neighbor policy here. And mm -hmm. I hope that Canada can be a more engaged and more active third neighbor to Mongolia. That's what we are expecting, and we're expecting from Canada in particular. Well, I hope some of your viewers will come and study in Canada. You know, we have that's excellent <laughs> universities. And uh -huh. one of the great things about coming to Canada is it's much easier to get a visa uh -huh. to come here than the United States. And to any graduate, we provide an automatic visa for a few years after graduation uh -huh. to pick up some skills. Mm. We hope, of course, you know, some people will stay, but we also hope people will come back to Mongolia, bring mining skills, bring engineering skills, and contribute to both relationships with Canada and development here. In that regard, your embassy here is very active. They organize uh, kind of education in Canada every year, fair. Mm -hmm. where Canadian universities come, Mongolians come and learn about each other and hopefully it will help. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I teach at McGill University mm -hmm. in Montreal, and uh -huh. I think it's a fantastic place for people to study. Uh -huh. You have the opportunity to take courses in both French and English. Uh -huh. You're in a, in a city yes. that's completely bilingual, yes. where many people speak three or four languages, yes. and you get a sense of Canada, but you also yes. get a sense of the world all yes. in one go. Correct. Thank you very much, Mr. House. Thank you for having me, and thank you to Mongolia for a fantastic for visit. And uh, having just now what we discussed certainly will be contribute to uh, creative st uh, structure, more positive structure of dialogue in Mongolia. I hope so. Thank Good you. luck to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.